Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A certain feeling of déjà vu here um, uh, from some five or six years ago when I used to t when I was a professor at Imperial. I have to say the audience th style has changed. Actually, having people coming in before the start of a lecture is really quite exciting. Really, <laughs> I might indeed. Uh, um, if Imperial actually wanted to pay me um, for having me on their note paper, I'd be more than happy to think about giving the occasional lecture. But there we are. Um, look, the uh, um, I go to. Uh, I the title of the talk is really something that I sort of developed fairly early on in my uh, career as Chief Scientific Advisor. And, I'm just, and so I'm then going to take you on a sort of broad tour of... And I, I subtitled this, um, this talk, What's Happening in the World? And uh, that's what I'm really wanting to talk about um, over the next uh, 50 minutes or so. So let's go into the first slide. Um, in 2008... Um, I think uh, given this audience and given the fact I was at Imperial, um, I'd, I'd left Imperial about a, about a month. And for the first time, I um, started to see things that were very unusual. Um, for the first time, the prices of food had been declining for 40 years. The concern about agriculture was butter mountains, wine lakes, wheat, wheat mountains or foothills or whatever. And it was a, agriculture was sort of seen as a real problem. And yet, um, in 2007, and I'll go to a bit of detail on this later on, you saw for the first time a fairly significant, a really big increase in the price of food. And it's the first time, as I say, for four decades. So I started to think about this at the time. Um, I didn't think there was a likely to be a causal relationship me between me starting as chief scientific advisor and food prices going up, but you never know. One has to keep an open mind about these matters, but it did seem moderately unlikely. Um, so I coined the idea, I, I, and really I, I'm going to revert to some of these issues because they are still current, but I thought about the, the idea of what I called a perfect storm. And the reasons behind it were I saw that Population was going up, typically about 6 million a month. Um, people were getting wealthier. Um, there was a real issue of food shortages. Um, there was curious weather patterns. All of these were driving, um, driving the, this increase in prices. And I pointed out, really, that many of these trends were actually occurring over really quite a fast time scale. As, as, these, say, as this um, slide with selected highlights come... Um, I thought that there was a real issue that we really needed to start addressing, not just climate change, which everybody talked about at the time, and we remember five years ago, it was very much high on the agenda. But I also wanted to say, look, we really need to have to think about natural resources and the pressure that the natural resources are going to be under. And I will come back to that theme because it hasn't gone. But I think I'll just start you with one sort of anecdote because one of the first places I visited um, when I was uh, chief scientist was Brazil. And um, there was indeed an Imperial College alumni who was running one of the major research stations in Brazil. And I went there knowing virtually nothing about this. It was one of the privileges of being a chief scientific advisor, not expecting to know anything about anything, you know, a little bit about um, a few things that you can bone up if somebody briefs you. So I went there, and this chap said to me, he said, we have an interesting system here of uh, cotton and soya beans uh, rot rotating crops. And he said, what do you think the fallow period is? Well, a fallow period between crops is typically, I don't know, two weeks, three weeks, sometimes a month. And he said, what do you actually think our fallow period of this is? And now look at the right-hand picture. He says, our fallow period is two hours. And... The picture on the right-hand side here is one that he, sh he showed. And what you see is harvesters taking away soybean and planters planting co cotton. They are about 100 metres from each other. And to add insult to injury, um, they, sort of add, they have two crops a year. So as opposed to what you might typically see in the UK, in the UK agriculture, where there are fallow periods of two, three weeks and one crop a year, what we're seeing in Brazil um, at that time, and indeed subsequently, is something that's completely dramatic. It's the most intensive agriculture you can see. I don't know that I want to live near there. I don't know that I want to be a keen bird watcher in the immediate vicinity. And of course, there are alternatives. But that was the sort of first insight I had into the sort of alternatives that we need to be thinking about some of these resource issues. And let me go on. The first thing I remember when happened when I 
raised this issue and pointed to the pressures of population and prosperity and, uh, and urbanization and so on, which I'll come back to, was the economists said, oh, this is such nonsense. You know, the prices have indeed gone up. There was a price spike, which is sort of shown here in this graph. Uh, but there'll be a supply-side response. People are getting more money, um, so farmers will plant more crops, so the price will drop. And really, this is just nonsense. Beddington sort of, you know, and everybody said, you know, Beddington slash Malthus and all this sort of thing. Um, and uh, I had to de dealt with that. And I have to say there's a certain degree of sort of complacency with you see the inner side, is that you see the decline followed the 2008 peak in prices, um, and then, bang up, it went again back in 2010-11. And, in fact, the increases went higher. And there's got to be reasons for this. And the reasons that I was outlining were <clears throat> very much the ones that massive increase in demand for natural resources driven by a number of issues. And the point here, and I'll come back to these issues of poverty later on, but that first price spike in 2007-8 um, in put another, billion, uh, another 100 million people into poverty. So just not enough energy to get it. Um, there were meetings to try to address it, and to an extent that has been. But exactly the same thing happened in 2011, and I do believe that we're going to see something similar happening in the next few years as well. So, so that's food, but also we had real issues that are, which are due, again driven by the increasing number of people in the world, by the number of people living in urban environments, and by the demand, you are seeing major issues of water stress. And this is a map produced by the World Wildlife Fund, um, and showing the areas that we have to expect water stress to occur in the world over in, by 2020, which is, what, seven years away from now? And these, you can see it very clearly, major issues of water stress, obviously, in India's subcontinent, in parts of Africa, indeed in parts of North America, but also, obviously, in parts of northern China. So that's it. And finally, the other things that were occurring, again, remember, I'm talking back in 2008, climate change was there. There was, a, there was an optimism around the Copenhagen climate change discussions. Clearly, I, in my belief, very, very unnecessary optimism. I don't know who put those lights on, but I didn't, so tell me what you want. Um, and it totally failed. I'm not sure. If I shake my head to the left, <laughs> on the right, no, yep, <laughs> the right work. <laughs> I can't always promise that to work, I have to say. But in, Cop in uh, Copenhagen, there was a major climate change discussion, and actually it was a failure. And subsequent ones I'll come back to later. So that was the situation in 2008 when I kind of had taken over. I was just getting used to the sort of slightly odd phenomenon of actually um, uh, working in Whitehall, um, a thing that was new to me. I'd, done work, I'd been at Imperial College for most of my career. So let me now move to the f first question, which is what's happening to the world. Now, obviously the world is enormously uncertain you know, obvious. But there are a few things that are absolutely going to happen. And I want to go through those, and I'll expand on in, in a moment. The first one is population increase. We're going to have another billion people on the planet by about 2025. So it'll move up from 7 billion to 8 billion. That's going to happen. Demography is pretty much determined. To give you a flavor for it, what could happen to stop it? Well, I suppose you can talk about major plagues or major disease uh, epidemics, but given the, the biggest uh, epidemic has probably killed no more than about 50 million people and the population is increasing by 6 million a month, it's not going to have much perturbation. So we're going to have another billion people on the planet, and I'll go on to that in a minute. The second key trend is urbanization. Um, 2010, the second year when I was chief scientist, the urban population for the first time exceeded the rural population. Um, and that trend will continue. Again, I'll come back to these. The third one is that, can, that actually, although there's enormous poverty, the world is getting wealthier. I'll give you a flavor for it. A recent report has come out and pointed out that there's about a billion people in the developing world who we'd loosely call middle class you know, on, in relative income. That's increasing by 100 million a year. So there'll be 2 billion people in 10 years' time who we call middle class with a, cons with a consequent effect on their demand 
for natural resources and goods and services. And those are the three trends that are really happening. Now, of course, prosperity could turn around. You know, we've had the Lehman Brothers, the depressions, but actually many of the key developing economies continue to grow. And the fourth thing that is actually happening, and I'll come back to that in a little bit more detail, is climate change is happening. And I think one of the things that people don't quite understand so well about climate change is that the time lags in the system are dramatic. The weather we're seeing now, if you like, the climate we're seeing, which is an average of the weather, is determined by the greenhouse gases that were in the atmosphere in the 1990s. There's a 20-year time lag, give or take. So the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are there, and they are the, that is the climate that is being that we're experiencing now. And hence, the next 20 years are pretty much determined by what's up there now. So those are the key determined trends. Now let me expand a bit on it. The first thing about population is that it's going to be asymmetric. It's not the population is going to increase, and the table shows that 2011, we reached 7 billion. 2025, 12 years away from now, it's going to reach 8 billion give or take. It may be a little bit earlier, a little bit later. Um, but it's divided, and this I think is really important, it's divided pretty much equally between Africa and Asia. So there's 500 million extra Africans in 12 years' time. 500 million extra Asians means the population in Asia goes up from 4 billion to 4.5 billion. In Africa, it goes up from 1 billion to 1.5 billion. This is going to be completely unprecedented, and it's 12 years away. Urbanization, the sort of, this is pointing to some of the issues. The top right-hand graph points that for the first time in 2010, the urban population exceeded the rural. The rural is in fact projected to stagnate, if anything, to go down slightly. And what we're looking at is that the urban world will dominate. Um, the sort of little examples I'm pointing down there are something of, you know, a, million, a city of a million people every five days between now and 2050. These are the sort of phenomena that it's very hard to comprehend. And just to give you a parochial flavor for it, in Africa, the expectation is that 500 million people will live in cities of about 500,000. Give or take, therefore, um, 1,000 cities about the size of Edinburgh in 12 years. Other phenomena we're seeing are aging, and there's issues to do with vulnerability, which I won't dwell on today. But if you look at um, the urbanization, the, this is the sort of pattern that we may expect to see, the red showing large urban conurbations. And one of the phenomena that you can see from that is very clearly an awful lot of this urban development is on the coast and therefore extremely vulnerable to some of the issues that we're going to see as I go into the points about climate change. And one of the sort of ironies of the world in there is that actually there's a lot of international migration. Uh, Rod referred to the Foresight team, um, who I led, and they had a, pr a, a study on international migration. The basic fear of some of the early discussions about climate change was that the OECD or the North would have hundreds of millions of migrants wanting to move north to escape climate change. In fact... When you get down to analyze it, many of the migrants are actually moving into the more vulnerable areas of the world. They're moving into cities that are on the coast, which are going to be more vulnerable rather than less vulnerable to climate change. And so what's the sort of state of play? A couple of years ago, I chaired an international commission on agriculture and climate change. And these are the sort of statistics where we're kind of starting out. They're about a year old. About a little under a billion people don't get enough water. Um, about um, a billion people don't have, are in genuine poverty. They don't have enough calories in their diet to sustain growth. And about another billion people are, um, are actually having a diet that is deficient in a variety of ways, and I'll come on to that a bit later. And some of the issues in terms of land degradation and so on are really, qu are really quite problematic. Um, waste is there, and I'll come back to that later. And we're talking about one and a half billion people living on less than a dollar and a dollar twenty-five a day. Now, one of the ironies of this is that as we bring people out of poverty, you increase their, their wealth, 
then of course they're going to spend more. They're going to have uh, the demand for food, for meat, and I've shown the meat consumption, looked back by a number of different countries, um, uh, for energy. All those things are going to actually increase and as we bring people out of poverty. And if you look at the demand with uh, increasing wealth, um, increasing population, increasing urbanization, you go to something which I call the three basic natural resources. Energy, water, and food. Let me just look at energy, which is in the top left-hand corner of the slide. The, the sort of um, the reddish shading is showing essentially the developing world with an enormous increase in the demand for energy expected out to the next few years. And that, um, by contrast, the OECD is, is actually operating on pretty much a flat trajectory of energy. So the demand for energy is going to come from the developing world. If we look to water, and water is the area that I think is most problematic, which um, I think we have got to address in a wholesale way as a, as a, a community, um, we're looking at about a 40% deficit in water. Um, and there's not, we're not making any more. So water demand, the demand for water is going to go up by about 40%. And there's going to be a 40% shortfall in available fresh water, starting from, as I pointed out, something of the order of 850 million people who don't have access to it. And in terms of food, and again, I'll come back to that, um, the increase, and there has been increase through agricultural productivity of the, of the um, yield, of, these are two typical crops, but even these increases are nowhere near meeting the anticipated demand. So these are the sort of things that are being driven by the simple factors of humanity, by increasing population, increasing wealth, increasing urbanization. And the pressures that this is having on our natural resources of food, energy, and water are shown in this graph. And that would be hard enough if we didn't actually have the issues of climate change. Now, it is sometimes characterized to me um, when I appeared on the media, that, oh, it's a debate where the climate change is happening. You know, all these bloody, these models, they don't mean anything very much and so on. And that is arguably a position that somebody might wish to take. I won't be pejorative. But let me just show you some things. This is not models. This is data. <coughs> let me show you the first slide. Now, this is a map of the world, and it shows the increase, the the little red, the red bits on this map, and this is taken from 55, 65, and 75, the red bits show temperature anomalies higher than the averages from the previous decade or so. So the more red you see, the more warmer it's getting. And that was 55, 65, and 75. You can see in 75 some of the things that are actually occurring in the north, in the, near the Arctic going a bit. So that's those five years, um, about 30 years ago. This is the last six years. And remember, this is not models. This is not the clever people at the Met Office do, producing something that um, they get well paid for and, uh, and use with large computers. These are, this is data. This is millions and millions of observation on, the, on, the, um, on temperature in the world. And I think you can see the difference between the top row and the last six. To have... a an intellectual position that there is not an increase in temperature. It's just such fundamental nonsense. I have no patience with it. This is happening. Well, let's just give you an example. And, you know, a nice, obvious, large example. Texas. Let's think about Texas, where, which is full of people who don't believe in climate change, incidentally, from the way they vote, um, which is interesting. <laughs> um, I, uh, and um, the, uh, this, the, the graph here shows uh, the map of um, temperature and uh, rainfall against each other. Temperature on the, the y-axis, um, rainfall on the x-axis. And the blue points are, are the last 100 years. You can see there's a pretty clear pattern. You know, it goes up and down. Two th the pink um, <coughs> is the thing from two years ago. Completely unprecedented. And it's hard to attribute these, but the analysis that has been done by the Met Office and NASA and others um, point to the fact that this is... Um, completely dramatic. That this is what was a one in two 150 year event is likely to happen about every five years. And I'm talking of Texas and I'm sort of kind of delighted that 
And when Obama came to power, he appointed a man called Stephen Chu to be his secretary for energy. And Stephen Chu um, is a Nobel laureate in physics, um, no slouch, and he um, was, had to go to a meeting with the governors of Texas and some of the other southern states to talk about climate change. And he came out and gave an interview and he said that um, people were entitled to their own opinions but not their own facts. <laughs> and you can see the sort of thing that he was referring to here. So that's the thing. Now one of the things that is often stated, again by those who are critical of the belief shared by the vast majority of science, people working in the science that climate change is happening, it's driven by humanity, is that this is nonsense. They only do that because they'll get promotions, they'll move from lecturer to senior lecturer, or they'll get research grants and so on. And, one of the, and, you know, in a sense, there's something in that argument because people will tend to move into fields where they will be published and they'll get, and they'll get a chance to do it. So one of the things that I've, I've done is look at some of the industry and the biggest and probably the most hard-bitten industry in the world is the insurance industry. Now, this is, let me show you, the bottom right-hand graph is connected, produced by Munich Reinsurance, one of the largest reinsurance companies in the world. And the graph is color-coded. The red, line, the red uh, bits on the histogram, showing for the last 30 or 40 years, are essentially natural disasters produced by geological phenomena. Um, tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanoes, and so on. Um, the other phenomena are all entirely uh, are all weather or climate driven. And as you can see, you are seeing a really biggish, big increase in the frequency of severe weather events. And this is something that we have got to expect. The insurers are seeing it, and they're pro making provision for it in their, in their actuarial calculations. And I think this is a good contradiction of the thing that this is all invented by the academic community of scientists who do that sort of thing anyway, and that's the way they get more notice. So Munich Ray are there. Now, I'm referred to the sort of failure of the, um, of the discussions in Copenhagen when I was um, early on in my, my time as chief scientist, and I think that one of the things that has come out from the subsequent failures of all the talks through Stowall is the international community has said, we will have a two-degree target. Um, that's fine, but actually, you, in order to hit a two-degree target of, a, of global warming, of an increase in average temperature over a pre-industrial level, you've got to do something about it. You've got to go cut greenhouse gas emissions, and that's not happening. This gives you an idea that, and this is a recent report that came out in September, points to the fact that the chances of meeting a two-degree target are really pathetically slim, unless there's a big change. And remember the point I was making earlier, that there's a 20-year time delay. The, the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere in the 1990s determine the weather patterns that we're seeing now. And you are seeing vastly increase in severe events, major changes, and an increase in over both sea level, melting of glaciers, melting of uh, snow cover, the decline in the, uh, the um, ice sheet around the um, Arctic, um, some, in, some indication of changes in patterns of um, plants and animals distribution and so on. That's all happening. So let me just sum up. What are the challenges up to 2030? We're going to have another billion people. Urbanization is going to be concentrated in cities. There's going to be more prosperity, we hope, but it's a further strain. There's complicated demographic and migration changes, and climate change is happening. There's going to be a risk multiplier. And to sum it up, 2030 I've put here, not 2025, but 2030, you're going to need about 40% more food, 40% more water, um, and 54% more energy. And if you don't do anything in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, you're going to see those emissions go up by 50-odd percent. And since 1990, which has determined our current weather, they've gone up a lot. There's been no cutback in emissions. There was a minor cutback in part of the OECD during the period post the Lever, uh, um, Lehman Brothers, um, which was entirely due to an, economic, uh, to an uh, um, industrial downturn. That hasn't happened. And indeed, many of the developing, developing world, like China and India, the most dramatic, uh, continue to increase their emissions. So this is the problem up to 2030. So what are we going to do? 
What about the past? Well, the past is a total fa- is a real failure. Um, I've talked about a few pointers here. The first thing is um, the linkage between food, water, and energy needs to be important. And we need to understand about ecosystems. Let me just briefly review this, because this is what happened broadly in the, in the, in the back, back half of the 20th century. Um, food. Increasing food production has ruined soils in large port, port parts of the world. I won't go into d- detail. I think you kind of get a message that um, the red is seriously degraded soil. And you can see the proportion of the world map that is that they're actually looking at. And so there are about 24% of the world's arable land or cultivatable land is currently uh, had significant degradation of its soil. Um, the, our companions on the earth, the biodiversity of the earth, all the indices point to a decline. This, thing, this particular one, I'm sorry, is slightly out of date. It ends in 2003, um, but in fact, um, I can tell um, the astute amongst you will probably work out quite what is actually happening as you go beyond 2003. I'll tell you, it doesn't turn up. Um, forestry, forestry has been an improvement, but again, issues of changes in the area covered by forest. Again, I'm going to about a decade ago. Some reversal, actually, in both Brazil, uh, in South America, and in parts of Africa, some reversal of this trend, but a big depletion of forest resources. And fisheries, which is what I actually used to work on a bit when I was um, at Imperial, um, massive issues. The red um, shows the worst managed fisheries in the world, and you can see that um, they rather in the ascendant. Um, these are very badly f- managed fisheries, which actually are overcatching, are overexploiting their um, the, the stocks. And actually. Um, about a third of animal production comes from fisheries, and it's a major source of protein, so it's something that really can't be ignored. And as we try to do so that's to do with the food issues, we see soil degradation, forest clearance to produce agriculture, and <coughs> in part energy, and trying to over-exploit the fisheries, a major issue. And trying to increase energy production has, of course, produced very big increases in greenhouse gas emissions. That's a typical um, slide from a couple of years ago. So those are the sort of things that are happening. Now these you probably all know if you read the newspapers and you, th- you, know, you think, oh heavens, I think I might go and watch Strictly Come Dancing rather than seeing a program like this, or not as you may prefer. And um, these are well known. But there's some things that are, just, that are less so. And one of the issues is acidity of the oceans. Um, the interaction between carbon dioxide and the oceans me- makes, the, makes seawater um, more acidic. Now, there's a very good lesson here. If you look at the top graph, this is how to show something dramatic by changing the scales of your graph. If you have the x-axis denominated in many millions of years, you can actually make something look pretty dramatic <laughs> uh, very quickly. But in fact, it is, this in, is nevertheless a real phenomenon. And what the problem we have with this ocean acidification is it's not reversible. The basic thing, physics, are the interaction between seawater and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, producing essentially acidic, various acidic compounds, uh, which make the world, make the oceans more acidic. And the falling off the cliff that you see in that top uh, top right-hand graph is the sort of thing that we have expectations for. And this is going to happen. Um, What's the consequences? By and large, we don't know. There's some things you can predict. Coral reefs have just about had it. Um, and some of the others, um, some other ecosystem effects will be had, as many of the zooplankton require significant amounts of calcium to develop, and ocean acidification undermines that. Um, this is not reversible in anything like our lifetimes. It's a 100-year, 200-year reversible, even if greenhouse gases stop being produced. And finally, Water. I'm not going to talk about rivers, but I would like to talk about subsurface water. Let me focus on the left-hand slide. Very well-meaning interventions by the Indian government provided pumping uh, facilities, subsidized um, things to farmers to actually um, bring water out from subsurface aquifers. 
and the red shows those aquifers that are seriously overexploited, the green that are already saline. Give you a flavor for this. The typical water, age of water that is being used in northwest India for irrigation is about 300 years. That means it's been underground for 300 years, and that's what's actually being currently used for irrigation in these areas. Now, I've talked about Africa, and in fact, our own British Geological Survey has found that there's very significant amounts of water subsurface in Africa, but it's in the wrong pace. You could, it would be possible, probably for a decade or so, to actually meet that increase of um, population living in cities in Africa by mining this water. If you do, it's just going to non, be non-sustainable. There's smart things we need to do about water. Um, I think the, one, the picture on the left was, is from Saudi Arabia, shows what is not a particularly smart way of using water from aquifers to actually um, generate um, agriculture. There are other things we can do to, do it, to uh, deal with it. And again, to go back to the issues... The challenges we've got are food security, about a billion people. We'll read, I won't read. I'm, I'm a, a five years in government mean that I am, having been spoken to by a large number of civil servants, I've managed to learn not to read slides to people. It is very boring indeed. You can all read, so I'm not going to read these slides to you. But I would point, there are three issues. There's water, food security, water security, and energy security, which we need to think hard about. And there's also some real human hardship here. I've recently been asked to um, chair um, an international commission on agriculture and nutrition. And nutrition is just terribly sad. This is the um, map of the world showing stunting. This is children who, um, in early life, have insufficient food of the right sort to actually develop normally. So there are typically couple of million children born every year who actually just don't develop. Their, their total height reaches about a metre and a bit. They have consequent, sometimes consequent problems of mental development and real issues. And this is a map that um, shows you where stunting is. Obviously sub-Saharan Africa, obviously the Indian subcontinent where stunting is common, which is there. And you know, there's a human cost in this. Similar picture, can we look at vitamin A deficiency, where you have a, a, a very, very large number of children who are affected by vitamin A deficiency, which means they essentially develop very, very serious problems with their eyesight. These are sort of the, some of the really difficult problems that we have to, f that are there at the human level. And of course, it's an enormous irony that, um, and I won't go into this in much detail, is at the same time you're seeing these issues of malnutrition and stunting and vitamin deficiency, you're seeing both in the developed world, which we've already seen, a major um, epidemic of obesity and the related diseases of, uh, that come with obesity, and actually you're starting to see that in the developing world too. So dealing with nutrition is really, really important. Should we care? Reasonable question in um, some environments. Should we care about these things? Well, let me just focus on food. This is a slide which I wouldn't hang my hat on, but it looks on the effect of food prices on political instability. Ends in about two in 2011, and of course we've seen nobody in their right mind would say the Arab Spring was driven by, solely by food prices. But it is interesting that the index of food prices that has, has actually occurred have been associated with particularly urban unrest. And there's a phenomenon here which one comes to, exp which is sensible, in the sense of increasing proportion of people are living in cities and, of course, the political powers in the cities. That's where riots can occur. And this just shows um, a study that... Um, came out a couple of years ago, stopping, it was published in 2011, and of course there are other things. But it is interesting to note the sort of problems that are actually occurring with that. We will be looking at, and I think Africa in particular, if we don't solve the problems of, the, of, these, of food, water, and energy security in Africa, we're looking at failed states and the consequence political instability that comes from that. So actually, enlightened self-interest says we do have to care. 
And climate change, and I was, um, this is sort of a statement I couldn't make when I was Chief Scientific Advisor, but I'm extraordinarily gloomy about, the, about whether the international community is going to cut back on greenhouse gas emissions. Let me show you this slide. Look at the bottom left. It's a NASA picture. Um, the, um, it's taken, and the light shows the light that is actually coming off, and you can sort of pick up the um, eastern seaboard in the USA with major cities. Look at the circle right at the top, which is the Balkan Formation in North Dakota. This is one of the major shale gas producing areas. But shale gas has dropped to a price where it's not valuable. Um, it's a waste product now because shale oil is, vast, is really much more valuable. That is the burning off of shale gas in the Balkan, in the Balkan shale, in the Balkan Formation. And you can see that comparable light that is being produced is to something like Minneapolis or Dallas. In such a kind of situation, it's very hard to think that you're going to see a move away from use, the use of uh, hydrocarbons. And two other points make there. Um, there's an irony that the Arctic is the most susceptible to, climate, to increased warming. As the Arctic warms, large reserves of fossil fuels are being laid open. And you've seen preliminary skirmishing both from countries and from companies as they start to look at it. And the third one, which is why I'm really pessimistic about this, is, the, uh, is to do with our coal reserves. Um, the coal reserves are shown, the dark blue is where there's a lot, and you can see North America, Alaska, the whole of uh, Eastern Europe, China and India have very significant amounts of coal reserves. I find it unimaginable that this will be left in the ground that it won't be used to drive economies, to drive, profit, to, to, to drive those economies and produce the energy demand that we're seeing. So these, I think the upshot of that, and this is not government policy or indeed John Bennington's policy, it's just an observation, it is very hard to see how that's going to be addressed. Now for the, the next bit of this talk, I'm just going to get, be slightly more optimistic because most people sort of leave a talk by me in the early evening desperately in need of drink and um, uh, we're not quite at the end yet so I'll, I'll try and cheer you up and then really depress you at the end just before you go for the refreshments. Um, so let me just sort of turn, so let me pause and say that there are smart things we can do. We are enormously ingenious. We do try to solve problems. We do have interesting ideas. Let me just sort of it. So for example, this, in, this is uh, in the developing world, a way in which one can think about intensifying the rice production and at the same time cutting back on methane. I won't go into the details of this slide. Those of you who want to are more than happy to give it. But there are systems that would actually uh, in, can be used in terms of rice production and thinking about agronomy to actually make things much more intense with much less inputs. Um, there's an idea of thinking about an agricultural system that sequesters carbon dioxide. This is an example of Ken uh, in Kenya, where in fact different types of agricultural practice can actually result in a, a reduction in fertilizer use, a reduction in um, uh, carbon dioxide in the environment, and indeed a sequestration of carbon dioxide into it, so-called climate smart agriculture. This is a thing that's being pushed very hard by the World Bank to actually subsidize farmers to change their style. When they make more money, they'll get subsidies for it anyway, and they will actually sequester carbon dioxide. So it's much more sustainable. And thinking about energy, there's lots of things that can actually be done. Um, obviously, there, this is a plethora of potential uh, energy solutions. This is something <coughs> focused in rural Africa, uh, where you have a real potential for both hydropower, biogas, and solar, for obvious reasons. So these are things that are really quite, that are fairly straightforward and don't involve high tech. But actually, um, I, I'm pointing to, I pointed to the ability of scientists to deliver, and actually, we have, the agricultural world has really delivered pretty well. This is a study from our own Rothenstead, which has looked at the um, increase in the yield of wheat. Rothenstead has had experimental plots going since the, 1870s, in the 80, early 1880s. And you can see the, and the, uh, the y-axis is the yield per hectare uh, in, kilo, in uh, tons. And moving up from about 2, kilogram, two um, tons a hectare up to about 8 now. 
big increase. Similar things in the red are showing the increase in the yield that has been produced by, uh, by uh, that. They've done pretty well. But as you can see, it's been flattening. And the reason it's been flattening is for 40 years, real prices were declining, and people saw the idea of increasing agricultural yield is, what on earth we want to do that? We'll just have bigger, bigger um, food mountains or wine lakes. 40 years of almost no investment in agricultural research in the developed world. 2020 hindsight's wonderful, but actually this is madness, and you can see this in the flattening. But Rothamsted, again, it's the oldest um, uh, agricultural research station in the world. Um, they, um, they have a target now to increase their yield. Remember, it's eight tons a year, uh, tons a hectare a year at the moment, to actually go that up to 20 by, to 20 by 2032. And this would be exportable throughout the world. And it needs to be done by a number of different ways. And the bullet points there, and I will point to a few of them, one is you need to improve the genetics, you need to be looking at pests and diseases, and you need to be thinking about some of the more physiology of it. Now, controversially, some of these techniques involve genetic mod modification. And um, last year, you may remember, um, there was a, a big fuss about the fact that um, Rothamsted had done something really rather smart. They crossed a gene, they'd used a gene from the peppermint plant and inserted it into wheat. And that gene produced um, a pheromone, or a smell, if you were, which was actually the alarm pheromone for aphids. Um, fantastic. It meant that aphids approaching the wheat plant moved away. They, didn't, they weren't even lost to the ecosystem, so birds and predatory insects could continue to eat them. Fantastic piece of technology, but attacked bitterly by NGOs who were against it. And there was a classic thing which I haven't shown, was a picture of a loaf of bread with um, a cow's head, tail, and legs coming out of it. This is what we're doing. Um, it was actually quite a success in the sense that they addressed these issues. And I had the job of having to think how we do it, because at one stage it looked like they were going to get 20,000 demonstrators ripping up the experimental plots at Rothamsted. Um, but actually, one, one of the things that I thought was really excellent was the Rotten said people engaged with the, um, with the NGOs. They debated with them, and they took them on, and they made the point that this is for the world, that we want to do the experiments, we want to try to see that this works, we want to make certain this is safe for humanity, for humankind of the ecosystems, and it worked. The 20,000 demonstrators we feared to, uh, to, turned out to be two, around about 200, of which 127 were French. I have nothing against the French. <laughs> Civil servant enough to do that. And whilst we're talking on GM, I did realize one time when I was, uh, that I had become a real civil servant because um, John Humphreys asked me on the Today program, did I agree with um, Prince Charles's views on GM cr crops? And I said, not entirely. <laughs> And I thought, oh, my God, I have really turned into a civil servant here. <laughs> my probity as an academic is lost forever, uh, or not forever, at least for a while. So, and, you know, GM is important. Um, the, um, the, the, this is a thing I uh, a map the bottom left shows the countries that are um, using GM technology uh, in natural agriculture. Um, this is the sort of... Um, uh, and I put it green to irritate um, various people in the, uh, in the NGO world by coloring, those, coloring the area of the map where they use GM crops green and the other one brown. Um, there, is a, uh, there is a change. Um, there's an interesting statistic that there is not a single bit of litigation in the USA of people who claim that they've actually um, suffered health problems from eating GM, GM products. And it's not exactly an unlitigious litigious society. Doesn't prove it, but it's there. It's, it's a point. And there's other things we can do. Um, that's very smart things, even in our knowledge of genomics. But actually, engineering and sensors. We're talking in Imperial College with enormous skills and reputation in engineering. You know, there's smart things we can do. We can think about doing things better. For, um, we can think about using sensors to control the application of water or fertilizers or pesticides. We can think about, uh, about using not damn great tractors, but small ones. So those are the sort of things that I think science and technology can reach us. And also we can move to very simple, non-high-tech things. 
This is a slide from Kew and points out that 12, just 12 plant species provide 80% of the, of the food that's actually consumed. And yet there's 30,000 species that actually are edible. Um, and we, could, we have not been investing in that. The vast amounts of investment in um, agricultural science and in, the, and in plant technology has actually been applied to um, just these 12 species. So there's a lot that could be done. And it brings in a vast amount of the sort of skills that we would see in a place like Imperial. And the other thing is that we can actually do something ourselves. Um, waste is an enormous issue. Um, starting to become to more public forefront. Um, in the developing world, about 40% of uh, crops are lost before harvest, and about another 40% of that, the survivor, lost post-harvest in storage. In the developing world, about, um, about 30% is actually thrown away after you've bought it in the supermarket. Um, that is an enormous um, change that could actually occur if there was, this was to be regulated. First, in helping the developing world deal with pest and disease, and second, in the management of consumer attitudes and demand so that we throw less away. Now, finally, and I really will depress you now, um, having cheered you up no end in the last uh, five minutes, I can see from the gloomy expressions in the, in the audience. Um, so what about 2030 onwards? Um, I've always sort of said that I couldn't really get excited by 2050 because I'd be 105. So, um, and this seemed to be a moderately unlikely um, age, to, age to reach. So 2050, yeah, this, you know, for the birds sort of thing. But what about 2030 onwards? Um, I will in, you know, the acute amongst you will work out, I'll be 85 in 2030. Um, and uh, what are we going to do? Well, the first thing that worries me like mad is population. These three graphs show the difference between the best estimate, which is the central one, and the estimate, and the upper one, is if we fail to see a decline in fertility. And the best estimate comes from an assumption that as prosperity increases, um, uh, you will see a decline in female fertility. But there's three determinants of female fertility come from the social studies. One is prosperity. The second is female education. Essentially, the more years of schooling a woman has, the fewer children she has. And the third one is the availability of contraception. If you, and we are at a turning point now, um, as you can see, the lines as you go out about 2025 are all very close together. They start to diverge as you get beyond 2025 in a dramatic way. And unless we see this decline in fertility worldwide, you are going to see a trajectory of moving up from not a, some form of equili um, equilibrium point of about 9 billion or 10 billion max to something that is way beyond. And that, I just think, is unsustainable. So challenges up to 2050, when you, I'll be 105, and many of you, by looking around, will, will be either a little bit older and a little bit, out, and a little bit younger, but we'll all be sort of um, getting on a bit. Um, these are the challenges up to 2050. 2.3 billion more people, urbanization nearly 70%. More prosperous, I think. Not certain that. But complex demographic trends. Obviously, the issue of um, reducing mortality means we have a very, very big increase in the age population. There will be migration. And climate change is, unless we see some turnaround, it's going to be, uh, uh, climate change will be driving it. Now, that's sort of depressing, but I do have a genuine faith that the first thing to do is to recognize these problems. To recognize they're intimately linked, that you can't think about food if you don't think about water, and you can't think about food and water if you don't think about energy, and you can't think about any of them unless you think about climate change. So the perfect storm, which I, I formulated as an idea in 2008, was all these things are intimately related. You've got to think about them as a piece. You've got to be thinking about a wholesale. And the way to intervene in it is by... Um, political decisions, changing, poli changing policies, but also we do have the potential to actually use our science and technology in the widest sense, including social science, to actually address these problems. So I'm pretty optimistic about it. Um, uh, but anyway, what do I care? I'll be 105 in Gaga. So look, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the interesting talk. Now, given that 
probably the single most pressing problem is the question of energy. Are there any good reasons why our government and other world governments have not devoted more time, money, to the development and utilization of geothermal energy? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and the question, if you didn't hear it, was about geo why more money is not invested in geothermal. I think, the, you know, in a sense, there's a political and economic dimension, and I could weasel my way out of it and saying I was chief scientific advisor, not chief economic or political advisor. But the, um, I think the geothermal energy is one of the areas that w one can be thinking about. Um, there are some problems with, with it, but... I think we should be looking at all the alternative sources of energy, and indeed governments are. I think the key thing is going to be whether, in fact, I believe that one of the key technologies that needs to be developed is something that involves the sequestration of uh, carbon dioxide into either old oil reservoirs or into natural uh, phenomena. I think that's probably the key one, but solar has the potential for doing a lot. Nuclear, I believe, has the real potential of not using large amounts of space which is a problem because if we actually think about renewable energy coming from biofuels, there's a competition there between growing crops for energy and growing crops for human food. But I think geothermals is, is one of a plethora of things that really would... Um, I wouldn't choose personally to um, bring it out as the, as, the key, as the key technology, but there has been underinvestment. Your point is correct. Yeah. Do you think... Financial speculation has played a significant role in the increase in food prices recently. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and there was a political position taken for a while by, I think, Sarkozy, that that indeed was the case. But the econometric analysis points not. Um, the main drive of the food price spike that we saw in 2007-8 was the drop in reserves. Typically, food reserves are about 35 40% of annual consumption. Um, uh, and they dropped to well under 12% in 2000, the back end of 2007. So the reserves that would actually could come in when there was a, a down in demand, uh, down in supply, primarily due to climate, uh, to weather related factors, particularly in Australia, that was the main factor. In 2011, um, we had massive issues of uh, heat waves and wildfires in Eastern Europe. And that was coupled with, essentially, because of the decline in the production, this was actually brought, this was supplemented by a ban by Russia and Ukraine on the export of grain, which again dropped the supply. I think that's much more, and all the rather detailed econometric analysis do, don't point to the fault being in, um, in the hands of financial speculators. Um, water, fresh water, does it get made or is it a fixed amount of water in the world? Yeah, the basic, the basic cycle um, is determined by, by and large by temperature. So the higher the temperature, the slightly more water actually goes into the natural cycle. But the main problem is what actually happens to it and how it's used. And one of the things, one of the errors, that, and quite a lot of water is in fact stored, for example, underground, which I pointed to, but also in glaciers, particularly the tropical glaciers, which are now melting. So we're seeing a change in, as it were, stocks and flows of water which need to be managed. And one of the things that we do know from um, the sort of climate, study, climate change studies is that we will expect more water, but more extremes of precipitation. We're going to see more droughts and more floods, put quite simply. There's a nice, ironic um, bit, it parochially, is when our poor Secretary of State for DEFRA announced in um, April last year that we were in, on the verge of one of the worst uh, droughts that we've ever seen, to be followed by six months of the heaviest rainfall we've seen in about 80 years. I felt a bit sorry for her, actually. Again, I don't believe there's a causal mechanism, but uh, one has to enjoy it. Um, but in terms of the sort of things that I think they're interventions, I think we squander water. I think there is a real squandering of water, and that is going to change. Mainly, it's a free good in many parts of the world. Um, it's mainly used in, at the moment. Um, about 70% of water worldwide is used by agriculture. 
Um, that comes up to about 85% if you're thinking about the developing world, because most agriculture is rain-fed irrigated land. Um, we need to be thinking about smarter ways to do it. Chinese are actually doing some smart things on that. They have actually, for example, um, as the tropical glaciers, glaciers in, um, in the Himalayas are, are melting, um, the Chinese are actually building uh, reservoirs to actually, con to actually um, store water underground um, to stop evaporation for obvious reasons. So there's things one can do. And actually where you are thinking about looking at water basins, there's obviously things to do when you have floods to actually use them rather than let the water go off into the, um, into the sea. So it's, it is enormously complicated how to do it, but I think we have both the modeling and the civil engineering skills to address some of those issues. And then at the very simple level, um, just thinking about you don't waste water on particular types of plants. You think about having plants that, are, that are, have a genetic composition that is resistant to drought and so on. There's a load of ways that we can actually do it. But I'm afraid in a 45-minute lecture, I didn't, have to go, I didn't have time to go into some of the technologies that are available. Okay, um, thank you. Um, bear in mind that you're expecting a massive increase in... Uh, you're going to need population. to speak louder, I'm afraid. You, um... Hello? Hello? Yeah, that's better. Okay, that's better. All right. Bear in mind that you're expecting a, a large increase in uh, global population. Um, do you expect innovation in food production, water, energy to be able to cope with the extra demand, or do you still expect demand to outstrip supply? Um, I think that, I think that uh, the honest answer to that is I don't know. Um, I think that the, the figures all point to increases in scarcity. Um, I think the reaction times to increase productivity or increase the availability of um, water is really quite long compared with what is a really a, quite a fast increase in the human population. Um, I think if, with the proper investment... Um, then there is a chance to actually meet that. I think by contrast, I think en energy, um, we do have technologies that can actually um, generate big increases in energy, and we're seeing that throughout the world, uh, keeping, easily keeping pace with uh, population growth. The problem about it is, is that the energy that's being produced is actually having a consequence of very, very large increases in greenhouse gases that are emitted. So it's a bit of a mix. And honestly, um, it will depend on both political and economic factors about whether you get the sort of level investment. I think what we will see, and we are seeing, um, is, is biggish increases in food prices. I think water will move from being a free good to, a, to being um, a valued good, um, not in all societies, but I think it will happen. And I think one of the sort of sadnesses of it, of course, is that um, both of these commodities are, um, if they're priced, it's the poorest whether it's the poorest in states or the poorest within a state, who are going to suffer. And, you know, the current debate in, in the UK about the price cost of energy is actually um, a, a debate that was, that was happening about food prices two years ago. So I think these are, these are the real sort of dilemmas and difficulties. I've been uh, plowing through the work of an excellent uh, British science fiction author, called Neil Asher. And in his vision of the future, human governments have been replaced by artificial intelligence who seem to do a much better job of dealing with these challenges. <laughs> um, well, I probably wouldn't comment on that. <laughs> um, I, am only, I think I had some um, contracts with um, the government and, uh, which lasts at least until two years after I... Uh, I stepped down as a civil servant, so I think I know your point, so with interest. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, you are, you are amongst friends, and whether you want to make any comment about... Uh, well, let uh, me... The let difficulty of en engaging and, uh, with, with uh, political people... Let me tell you a story, Rod. Fire. Rod, let me tell you a story. My, one of my earliest lectures, uh, when I was chief scientist, was um, I shared with the minister, of better name be nameless, and as ministers always do, they are on a panel, but they do, and they have to leave. They've got something terribly important to do. So I said um, to the audience, about double the size of this one, I think, and said, well, now the minister's gone. I can really tell you what's happening. And um, everybody laughed. 
And then I saw myself on news at 10 <laughs> saying, now the minister's gone, I can really tell you what's happening. <laughs> uh, I, that is not a mistake I would make again. <laughs> Thank you. For your comments. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, thank you. You've, you've shown us some interesting smooth curves, mm. and you've also yeah. said that something or other is not sustainable. Mm. I take not sustainable to mean that the curves stop being smooth and stop rising and fall off a cliff. Mm. How do we understand ahead of time what kinds of cliffs we might fall off? Um, and if we can understand it, mm. can we communicate it to policymakers? Yeah, very interesting question, actually, because I think there are... What, um, I can answer it in a whole series of ways. For example, in, cli in climate change con considerations, one of the biggest worries, for example, is the sort of positive feedback that you can generate, so, um, which means you go into highly nonlinear responses. So, for example, the big worry about um, climate is the warming of the uh, tundra. And the warming of the tundra will mean, well, tundra is the sort of frozen vegetation from previous ice ages. That tundra, once warm, will see a rotting of the vegetation and the production of methane gases coming from it. That's one of the things that actually we kind of know theoretically. But what we need to be doing actually is having a network of sensors that actually can tell you exactly when that is happening and you can see where you move to a tipping point. Others are more difficult, but I think, for example, the take a aquifer as the management of water. You know, you don't have to be a genius to work out using water that's 300 years old is not exactly going to be sustainable on a time scale of a few of a decade. But what we can do, and there are some techniques now that will, can actually, using gravitational uh, wave technology, using satellites to actually assess how full aquifers are, um, and so there are ways that we can actually think about doing things that are more sustainable. Um, I've shown the curve, but you, you make an, another analogous point, in, in this, and that is that I showed smooth curves. Of course, they're not smooth. Um, of course, there's stochasticity around it. I, I made them smooth for the sake, and there will be variation around it. I think that what I would say, however, is that the variation around demography is quite slight. You're averaging many hundreds of millions of events. So, it, you know, you could get a change but actually the demography is much the same. Some of the big trends where you're talking about many, many millions of events like urbanization are also, the, as it were, the average is a reasonable um, representation. What you can't do is have something that is very, is in essentially a smooth curve for what is happening to climate. That will always be fundamentally stochastic for a variety of reasons. First of all, the weather system is fundamentally chaotic. Secondly, that there is big uncertainties to do with what the responses are, and so those will always be highly uncertain. So most of the projections in weather will always be fundamentally stochastic. Thank you. Ryan, I'll take a couple more questions. One there, one there. Uh, uh, I was going to say, that there's no noise coming out, so you've got it the way we're on the way around. Is that, is that better? That is Brilliant. indeed. Yes, Fine. thank you. We hear a lot about the sort of disaster scenarios, in fact, ad nauseam. What we um, hear less of are the possible solutions to these, rather than thou shalt not do this or that. Yeah. For example, there's a vast amount of very interesting work going on in institutions. Uh, this place, for example, quite absolutely fascinating. Uh, I believe there's a great need for this... Um, technology and the possibilities actually to be seen, publicly seen. Would you support the idea of having a centre, um, international, worldwide centre, in London, to demonstrate all these technologies, a showcase for the industries involved in renewables, etc., etc., including GM, so including new nuclear, um, Telegraph, very interesting article today on uh, thorium. Um, mm power stations, would you support the idea? The, the place, I would say, the uh, Battersea power station, currently undergoing redevelopment, it's going to be about eight years before anything yeah. materialises, have had a con consultation uh, week this last week. I think, to answer your question, I, I wouldn't 
focus on London as being the obvious place to, have, to do that demonstration. I think that, I, I think that if you are wanting to demonstrate technologies, you've got mechanisms via the World Wide Web to get it at vastly more available. And, the, you know, London, Britain is a population of 70 million. Um, this is peanuts in the world. Um, so I would say, but in terms of the, the initial point you made, yeah, and I did try to point that it is not just gloom and doom and disasters, that there are technologies that are being developed. You know, I didn't focus on the technologies in energy in particular, but focused on ones in food. And yes, I think we absolutely have got to do that. And we need to be more positive, um, because in a sense, I am upbeat about it. I think that ingenuity um, will help. But it's ingenuity with political and financial backing that really needs to be, to be done. And part of that is, say, of course, um, is actually doing it. But I wouldn't hang my hat on the Battersea Power Station as the way to do it. And you don't have a second chance. You can grab me afterwards. There's one other person wants to speak. Yes, miss. Uh, how big a problem do you think meat consumption is? <laughs> well, speaking personally... <laughs> um, it's an interesting one. Um, the, there is no doubt that there is an issue with um, greenhouse gas production, particularly methane, from, the, from livestock herds. But about 20-odd percent of land in the world can only really be used productively by livestock because, they can con because livestock can convert very high-level, um, complicated cellulos cellulosic structures into protein and uh, carbohydrate. So um, I think that it would be extremely unwise to recommend that meat-eating stops um, uh, because we actually can make very, very productive um, grazing systems which will work. I think the area which is quite problematic is where livestock are actually being fed on grains that could be used by humans. And that's a rather, that's a rather different, different issue. I don't think we're at that stage yet. Um, so it's, it's complicated. In fact, I've got a, I and some co-authors have got something coming out in Nature next, next month, um, on, which is actually addresses what might be sustainable livestock for good quality diets. Because one of the problems about malnutrition is that actually meat does actually help um, the sort of malnutrition you observe in the developing world, in parts of the developing world. One more, and then I want to drink. Okay? <laughs> I was actually going to ask, there, German, he's allowed. <laughs> well, I'm, asking, I'm going to ask the audience to sit, give you a break, you see. Uh, because there are a lot of young people here who are under 20. Quite a number of people are under 20. You talked, in your talk, you talked about figures in, uh, of uh, 2050. Well, it's actually not that far yes. ahead for these people who are under 20 in this audience. Um, uh, some of the audience may not be here in 2050, but a significant number of uh, people will be here. Well, I just wondered whether any of the younger people here might want to make a comment about what they've heard this evening or felt, is, is it depressing to you or, or, or do you feel that uh, mankind will solve the problems and we will solve the problems? I just wonder if anybody would like to comment on that. Um, yeah, well, as a child, I, I knew quite a lot about global warming, which is quite surprising. And I always blamed, like, the grown-ups of the world. It's all their fault. Like, they pull the CO2 into the atmosphere, and it's, it's all down to them. And, and now they're going to ruin, like, like the, the younger generation's lives in the future. And I still kind of believe that. And I think we, we might have, like, we might have the ingenuity to come up with a solution, but it's highly unlikely to happen, and things are getting worse and worse. And so... I basically blame all the adults in this room. And the Fair enough. I don't think I can comment on that. Does anybody else want to comment on that? Would you like to comment on that point? I mean, I've tried to get some commentary around that there's the problem of who screwed up. I just have a question in terms of who runs the world. If, given that people free democracies in the West, it's the best way to govern the world way of big short-term choices for themselves compared to Chinese centralized governments who can make hard decisions for people, you know, one-child families, would the world be best served by having less democracy? 
I'll definitely say I am the chief scientific. I was the chief scientific advisor, not the chief political advisor for that one. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sir John, for an absolutely magnificent uh, talk.